So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going on the clock. Asking me to teach for uh, 20 minutes is trying to fit a camel through the eye of a needle. Uh, <laughs> Good illustration. If you, if, you, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you know me, you know I like to talk. So, um, all right. Uh, if we look at the book of John, in John chapter 20, verse 30, the apostle writes the purpose of his narrative and his gospel, his account of Jesus' ministry. In verse 30, it says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that is the subject of what I want to talk about today, uh, life in the name of Jesus, the subject of the new birth as described in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And what do the scriptures teach about being born again? This is an incredibly important subject. Of all the subjects in the world that we, as people of this world, need to be right about, is the subject of the new birth. Because Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And like our brother Steve Rafalski always reminds us, this is a matter of life and death. So what does it mean to be born again? The new birth is the life of God in the soul of a man. Steve Lawson describes it that way. I'm going to say it again. It's the life of God in the soul of a man. It's God creating new life in the dead and empty, hopeless souls that we have. And we are born spiritually dead. And without the spiritual life of God inside of us, we stay that way. When we are born with physical life. Each one of us is born in natural birth. But we are not born with the spiritual life when we're born physically. Uh, it is the impartation of God, uh, of eternal life into our empty souls, that we might have the life of God in us. And it's the greatest miracle God could ever perform. It's the most life-changing experience on this earth. It is an instantaneous thing. It's not a progressive thing. And whether we can pinpoint our time of being born again or saved, uh, not all of us can do that, but it's instantaneous. And it's a supernatural work of God. Uh, it doesn't just uh, wash the facade of our lives, right? It doesn't just uh, make us better people, but it goes to the very deepest level of our hearts and our souls. It changes our are completely our lives. And uh, it's an eternal work. Once you're born again, you can never be unborn. And we know that it is a saving relationship with God. When you're born again, your sins are forgiven. So before we take a look at the new birth and zoom in on the famous dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus and what that shows us about it, uh, let's just quickly pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that uh, Jesus, you would be magnified, you would be seen, Lord, uh, that, that, Lord, we make much of you today, uh, Lord, we pray that uh, through this scripture we would see our need of you, our desperate need, uh, Lord, to, uh, of life, and uh, Lord, we would see Jesus as uh, incredibly beautiful, in Christ's name, amen. amen. Great. So please turn with me to John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Dan, can you read that for us? John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Sure. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? 
Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Thank you. If you're taking notes today, uh, I have a three quick point outline, uh, three observations about this text. The first one is Nicodemus' investigation of Jesus. The second is Jesus' observation about Nicodemus. And then the third point, verses 5 through 8, is Jesus' affirmation of himself and God's work. And I'll, I'll repeat those later on. So, who was this Nicodemus? John makes it a point to, uh, to note that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. Uh, back in Jesus' time, there were 6,000 Pharisees, and these guys were the most strictest religious guys of the land. Uh, this guy had pedigree. He was a theologian. He probably uh, knew the Old Testament better than anyone in this room. Uh, he probably knew most of it by heart. And the word Pharisee actually means separatist. So he actually ke- he, he kept himself, and along with all the other Pharisees, as separated from the things of the world as possible. He kept strict Mosaic law. And he was totally devoted to God in this way. And actually John describes him as a, as a ruler of the Jews as well. And so that means he was one of the 71 Sanhedrin, which these guys were, they had complete jurisdiction over all religious life in Israel at the time. And actually, Jesus kind of singles out Nicodemus here, and he says that he was the singular teacher of Israel. This guy was the most prominent teacher of all of Israel at the time. And if you were a Jew during that day, uh, and you had to point out the one person who was the closest to God, who you thought was just, this guy is going to heaven, this guy is near to the kingdom of God, it would be Nicodemus. No one knew the Old Testament better. So, as... We find Nicodemus sitting in this prominent position. We also see him not secure in his own heart. He's going to Jesus, and he's asking Jesus about himself. And we see him being drawn to Jesus, because we know it's the will of God drawing him there. So how does Nicodemus uh, come to Jesus? He comes by night. Why does he come by night? Uh, He wanted to have a private encounter with Jesus. He's the most prominent uh, teacher of his day, and the other Pharisees... Uh, did not favor Jesus. So he didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want to be scrutinized by the other Pharisees. And actually in John chapter 12, verse 42, it says this, Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So I'm not sure if Nicodemus was uh, worried about being put out of the synagogue, but he just didn't want to be out in the open associated with Jesus. He wanted to come privately. In verse 2 of John chapter 3 that we're following, Nicodemus says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, there was an interest inside of Nicodemus to search out Jesus who does these miracles. Uh, We could assume Nicodemus maybe felt an emptiness, but as he listened to Jesus preach, we know from the scriptures, Jesus spoke like nobody ever spoke before. He spoke with authority, the authority that came from God. And and so Nicodemus had questions about Jesus. And he seems to know that Jesus comes from God, right? He says, we know that you come from God. This is not an indication of any kind of faith yet in Nicodemus. But he's saying, essentially, we know that you're blessed by God. You have power uh, power from God to do these kind of miracles, kind of like uh, he thought the way God acted in Moses or acted in, in like Jeremiah. So he doesn't even ask a question. Nicodemus doesn't ask any kind of questions. But he, uh, Jesus just responds to him. So Nicodemus doesn't ask a question, but we can kind of imply here that he's saying, you know, who are you then, Jesus? Are you more than a teacher? Are you a prophet? Nicodemus knew that there, this is something unique about Jesus here. So in the process of discovering that Jesus was far more than a teacher come from God, that he was God come to teach, and not just to teach, but to save, to redeem, and to save sinners. My second point is Jesus' observation 
of Nicodemus. So we looked at Nicodemus' investigation of Jesus. Now let's take a look at verses 3 to 5, Jesus' observation of Nicodemus. Jesus doesn't respond back to Nicodemus with his inquiry. Uh, Jesus doesn't say, wow, Nicodemus, ah, I, you, you think I come from God? I wish everyone in Palestine thought that about me. He doesn't do this. He gets right to the core of Nicodemus' problem. You know, in the previous chapter of John, Jesus says he knows what's inside man. Like a lot of people were looking to follow him because of the, the works that he was doing, but it wasn't a genuine faith. Jesus knows what's inside man. He gets to the very core of Nicodemus' problem. It's kind of like uh, if you were going to the doctor to get like a routine checkup, uh, maybe your blood pressure checked. And you go to the doctor and you're, you're looking at the doctor's certificates and degrees on the wall and you kind of want to ask them about him. And the doctor just responds to you and says, you are terminally ill. There's something seriously wrong with you and gives you grave news about your spiritual health. That's what Jesus and how he responds to Nicodemus here. And Jesus says the words, truly, truly. And what that means is, this, what I'm about to say is of the utmost importance. There's authentic truth into what I'm about to say. In verse 3, he says this. Jose, could you read verse 3 for us? Jesus answered and said to him, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Thank you. So Jesus is direct here. He says, unless you're born from above and experience spiritual birth from above, you cannot even see, you will not even enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not enough that you go to church. And he's not just talking to Nicodemus here. He's talking to all of us. It's not enough that you go to church. It's not enough that you fellowship with someone. Uh, it's not enough that you serve the church. It's not enough that you read the word of God even. Uh, but you must have a personal experience with Jesus, with the living God. And you must be born again. And it's not something that we can do. It's something done to us by God. So all of Nicodemus' religion, all of his strict study, uh, doesn't help him in this realm. It doesn't help him here for the, really the most important need that he has. His religion cannot be replaced by the new birth. So... Uh, so moving on, we see here that Nicodemus doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. He's still thinking in terms of natural birth. And Nicodemus says in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? How could he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And some commentators think that Nicodemus is speaking in like metaphorical language here, that like almost saying that, you know, how can a man, how can a man my age change his ways even when he's old? But maybe he is thinking about the new birth, uh, just the natural birth here. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't understand Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus doesn't understand here. So Jesus here is, is not just making an observation to Nicodemus. He's, he's making an observation about all mankind. So, so what is the new birth and how does it connect to Jesus here? How does that connect to Jesus? Well, the new birth, we said earlier, is the life of God in the soul of a man. It's regenerating our, our dead souls and then bringing us into the sphere of salvation. It is uh, crediting to us righteousness that is not our own uh, and making us righteous in God's eyes because of Jesus' righteous life and his sacrificial death. death. It's no longer being condemned for our sin and no longer being under God's wrath for our sin. And once we are born again, inside of us there's uh, an affection for God and things for God that wasn't previous there. We didn't desire God before this. Let's see what the scriptures, uh, different scriptures say about what is the new birth here. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus here is saying he is the life. So he is the life that we need. In 1 John 5, 11 through 12, it says... This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the, has the Son has life. But then we, we hear from other passages of Scripture, it says in John 6, verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. So therefore, how does Jesus factor into this whole new life thing? Well, we, we have to have the Son, is what the Scripture tells us. We, Jesus is the life. But 
John 6 tells us it's the Spirit who gives it to us. So the Spirit gives us the Son. We have to have the Son. So really, we're looking here at un unity to Jesus through the Spirit. We, we have to be connected to Jesus, who is our life, the Son of God who is our life. And that comes through the Spirit giving that life. And John Calvin says it like this. John Calvin says, The Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to himself. So summed up one more time, the new birth is when the Holy Spirit supernaturally gives us new spiritual life by connecting us with Jesus through faith. So why does Jesus say you must be born again? It's a requirement. <clears throat> Jesus points out that our physical birth is not enough, that Nicodemus' high religiousness and high follow of sort of following the law in his own eyes is not enough. There has to be another solution or remedy, right? Why can't we just improve ourselves morally? Why can't we just be more self-disciplined? Why can't I just love my family more? There are guys that just quit smoking. There are guys that don't watch pornography. There are guys that love their families better. There are guys that just work harder at work and, and, and better. But even if we do all of those things, even if you right now try to keep the whole law, we're still dead. We need, we need radical spiritual regeneration. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2 says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. You know, where does this originate from? If we go back to the Garden of Eden, we go back to where Adam took the, took the fruit, disobeyed God, and God said, in chapter 3, this day you shall surely die. And he wasn't just talking about physical death, although he was. He was talking about spiritual death. We are disconnected from a holy God now. We cannot do anything to come to God like a dead person. A dead person, I've never seen a dead body before, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't get up and start walking around. It couldn't go anywhere by itself in and of its own will. That's just like us spiritually. We cannot come to God in and of ourselves. That's why Jesus says you must be born again. You must have, from the outside in, new life given to you. And then you can be united with God. John 12 says this. He has blinded their hearts and hardened, uh, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. When we're spiritually dead, we have a hard heart. We're not responsive to the things of God. We're not responsive to the word of God in obedience or aiming to please God. We never aim to please him. So Nicodemus saw the supernatural work of God in, in Jesus. He said, you're a man that comes from God. But he didn't realize that he needed a supernatural work inside of his own heart. Let's move on. My third point here is Jesus' affirmation of God's work. So we looked at Nicodemus' investigation of Jesus. Jesus' observation of the spiritual deadness of man and the need for new life and new birth. And now we're looking at Jesus' affirmation of God's work and his own work in verses 5 through 8. Here he's talking about how is, how is one born again? We looked at what it means to be born again, why you must be born again because we're spiritually dead. But how is one born again? How is one, how does it work out in our hearts and in our lives? How am I doing on time, Phil? Okay, getting there. getting there is very good. Uh, all right, so from the surface level, I, I remember being at youth camp, and, and you know, as a, as a Calvinist, you're not really just telling people, all right, you just got to wait for God to do something. Just sit here, wait, you know, do nothing. Uh, you're just going to wait for one day just to pour on your head and fall on your head. Salvation just falls on your head. The advice I, I would always give to these youth who, who I minister to is, you know, What's holding you back from coming to Christ? You know, come to Christ. Repent. Believe. And from the surface level, from our own level, we are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But from the divine perspective, like an iceberg, there's so much more underneath the sea. From the divine, divine perspective, uh, salvation is a miracle. We see it uh, display the grace and the power of God in salvation because salvation is unto the Lord. And it is a work. It is the most significant work of God in man. 
In the first passage of the Gospel of John, and kind of like the prelude of John, the first 18 verses, uh, John 1, in verse 11 through 13, he says this. Uh, turn with me there in verse 11. This is important. John 1, verse 11. <coughs> He says this. He came to his own, and his peep and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Alright, there we see John give three negatives and one positive about how one comes to being born again. He says, born, born again is, is, is becoming children of God, becoming in the kingdom of God, is not of blood. It has nothing to do with your human descent. It doesn't matter who your father is. It doesn't matter who your mother is. No one is automatically saved because their parents are saved. No one's born again because their parents are born again. Uh, young guys who are here, you know, if you're not born again, your parents, who, who may be saved, it, that doesn't mean you're in the kingdom. At all. Um, if anyone could have boasted their own lineage in making a relationship to God, it was the Jews of Jesus' day. Oh, even more so Nicodemus, because the Jews uh, had the whole Old Testament of being a nation of God by, by blood. We know salvation was by grace at that time, but Nicodemus, whose bloody lineage gave, you know, thought they gave him a special relationship to God, yet he, had to, he still had to come to faith. Jesus says, You're not, you, you must be born again. It's not about your blood. Uh, then he says the second negative, and the third one. Nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Uh, you've heard this, the expression uh, is, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. But where, where there's man's will, there's no way. There's no way to God. But where there's God's will, that makes the way for us. You know, this text here in John 1 refers to man's willpower to kind of pull himself up by his bootstraps. And, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to come to God. I'm going to initiate my relationship to God. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to <coughs> discipline myself. I'm going to do all these things. But the scripture says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's, that's you. That's me. That's even Nicodemus. And according to the scripture, we see God is doing the work in salvation. It is by God and his sovereign will to lead man to believe upon Christ and to believe upon his Son. In Titus 3, it says this, verse 5, He saved us not because of works done by, right, by us in righteousness, which, by the way, all our works are as filthy rags, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. By the washing and regeneration and renewal of of the Holy Spirit. We already said earlier, salvation and the new birth is by the Spirit. And here's the one positive. So you have the negative. Not, not by blood, not by the will of man, not by will of the flesh. And here's the positive. But by God. Are you born again today? If you're born again, are you born again? If you're born again, I want to tell you that with the full confidence and assurance that it was God who initiated that in you. It wasn't you. It wasn't you who chose God. And he initiated your conversion and regeneration. It was his will who pursued you and brought you to himself. He gave you his spirit. He brought you from death to life. He's going to give you the resurrection. And all glory goes to God because of this. So, Nicodemus here at this point, he still doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. But remember, Nicodemus knows the Old Testament super well. And Jesus points back to the Old Testament here. So we see in, in, in verse 5 and verse 8 in John 3, he says, he, he, he compares the new birth and the ministry of the Spirit to two, two symbols, water and wind. Water and wind. And, and so Nicodemus, as he's hearing these things, like the word new birth, he's probably thinking, right, what, what do I know in the Old Testament about? What, what? He, he's not thinking it's the Old Testament, but what do I know from scriptures about this? And 
Um, you know, in this reference to water here, it's important to know that a lot of denominations out there think this is, has to do with baptism. This does not have to do with baptism. Baptism does not save a single person, right? It's, it's, then that would be us initiating our own salvation, our own new birth. <clears throat> we know this has nothing to do with baptism because uh, Jesus, who's still talking in, uh, in, ver- in the rest of John, in, in verse three, you know, John 3.16, one of the most famous passages of Scripture, he's talking to Nicodemus there. And he's talking a lot about faith. He's not talking about the washing of water from baptism. He says in verse 15, Whoever believes in me may have eternal life. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Verse 18. Verse 16. Whoever believes unto him will not perish but have eternal life. Talking a lot about belief in Jesus. No mention of water baptism at all there. So we know he's not talking about water uh, here when he says uh, in in. in in chapter 3, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But what Jesus is doing, he's pointing Nicodemus back to the Old Testament. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24 to 27. And you should know here that uh, Ezekiel is prophesying that what God would do for his people when he brings them back from exile in Babylon. But there's greater implications here, right? He's talking here. Um, this acts as also a new covenant promise. So this applies to us today as well. He says this. And Nicodemus would have been familiar with this verse, and he should have applied it. So he says this. I will take, from you, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is, this is key. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I mean, there's such glaring parallels to what Jesus is saying in John 3 here that, you know, I'm surprised the red flags didn't start going up in in Nicodemus' head. But we know that, you know, uh, understanding the scriptures, it has to be revealed to us. It's not just you understanding it. So we see so many parallels and so many images here. We see the the, the use of water. And and what Jesus means here uh, when he refers to Ezekiel, he's saying... uh, you need, to, you need to have spiritual water, not just regular water. Because regular water just cleans us off and our dirt off from physical dirt. But spiritual water and a spiritual cleansing cleans your soul. He's saying this. He says, uh, Nicodemus, you, you must be and everyone must be washed of your sin. The new birth has to do with the washing of your sin. And we know our sin's not washed unless it's paid for on the cross. And we know Jesus accomplished that on the cross. So we must be forgiven of our guiltiness. And then he says, also, Ezekiel goes on to say, I will put a new heart in you, a heart of flesh. Now, he's not talking about like a physical heart here. He's talking about a heart that's soft and responsive to the things of God. You know, before the new birth, we are passionate about a lot of things. You know, I'm sure Dan McCleary was passionate about music before he was born again. I was very passionate. You could ask my dad. I was passionate about comic books. Uh, I would like... Uh, I would get off the bus and, uh, and, and pretend to walk a different direction. And when all my friends left, I, I doubled back and went to the comic book store. Uh, so no one would see me as a nerd. Uh, I was passionate about comic books. But uh, I'll tell you one thing I wasn't passionate about, and I can never be passionate about, unless I have a new heart of flesh put in me, and that's the things of God. You know, there's a great song that's inspired by the Valley of Vision that we sing at Grace Baptist. It's, it's called, Oh Great God. And it says this, I was blinded by my sin had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys, had no taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me life and opened up your words to me. We, are, we have no interest in the things of God or God before our hearts ha- are given new life by the spirit. We are irresponsive to the things of God and the word of God until... We become responsive to it, and that's only 
through the new birth. And, mm -hmm. and as we're drawing to a close here, uh, Jesus also compares the spirit to wind. And the reason why he does this is because, you know, as, as we see, I'm going to read it for you. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And what he's saying here is that, you know, we can't see the wind, uh, but we see the effects of the wind. Uh, we can't control, who can control the wind? Uh, there's no, Captain Planet is actually not a real person, okay? And no one can control the winds. So it is the operation of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, he's saying here that the new birth, like he's saying earlier, is, is a sovereign thing. It is God who controls it. Uh, we can feel its effects. We can see its effects. Sometimes when you're listening to a, a sermon uh, and listening just to the word of God, you, you, hear, you feel the tugging on your heart, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is uh, the, the wind moving where it wishes. Uh, we can't look at a, a person who's not a believer and say, um, you know, this person is, is probably going to get saved or is probably not going to get saved. That is God's business. Salvation is unto the mm -hmm. Lord. And the wind blows where it wishes. Um, so Jesus is, is, is saying that uh, to essentially say, you know, Nicodemus, uh, you know, I am in control of salvation here. And, and because you're dead, uh, you know, you, first of all, you must, you must be born again. Um, and so... You know, just Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, uh, you know, his message is clear. And unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot have eternal life. Uh, and it gives God the glory. It gives him all the glory in this. Uh, just a couple of application points. Uh, let's be like Nicodemus. And what I mean by that is this, responsive to the word of God. And you can't do that unless your heart is made of flesh. Uh, Nicodemus, later on, uh, even though I believe this was a conversation that is instrumental in his salvation, Nicodemus later on sticks up for Jesus in chapter seven, and he will be near Jesus in Jesus's burial, and he will adorn Jesus's body with myrrh, expensive myrrh and aloes. He will associate himself fully, disregarding what the other spiritual leaders think. He will associate himself fully with Jesus here, and I believe he has salvation. I believe he was born again, Nicodemus. Let's, let's be like him and, and hear the word of God and respond to it and obey. And if we're born again, uh, we must be repentant since we're a new creation. We're literally a new birth. We're a new creation. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. First John says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. People who are born again are, make it their habits to be obedient to God, to practice his righteousness. There's evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, and finally, our, my last application point is to pray. Is to pray for others to be born again. You know, we're told that we won't see the kingdom of God if we're not born again. But then we're told we can't make ourselves be born again. This is... This is unsettling to us. I, I think of my, my daughter, who I, I can't... I, the, the one thing I want above all else, I don't care if she's an engineer, I don't care about anything like that, I care that she is born again. I care that she is saved. But I can't do, I can't do that. Uh, what I can do is, is expose her to the Word of God. And what I can do is pray for her, since uh, we know that because of this truth, we are absolutely dependent on God. So we must pray for those who are still dead in their sin, dead in their spirits. And, uh, you know, simply, like the hymn says, you know, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. We must be dependent on God because he is the, uh, he is the author of our salvation. And we must be born again. Praise God. Amen. Amen.